Hello, uh, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Drug and Alcohol Research and Innovation Advanced Learning Network, um, or DARIA as we know it. We will start very shortly. I'm just going to give people a few moments to sign in. It's only just gone 2.30. We'll give um, people a couple of moments just before we start things up in earnest and I can introduce today's speaker uh, and uh, we can get going. So welcome to those who are already online uh, and we still have a steady stream of people rolling in, which is lovely uh, and good to see. Um, and hopefully we'll get a few more going as we um, before we kick off in earnest, we, um, I hope everyone's had, we, we, we might have a few people who are down south who might have the, from sort of the, those districts closer to the border who, I don't know whether they get the, the, the Melbourne Cup Day holiday. I don't think so, but, uh, that might, uh, there might be a few people, taking that extra day for the cheeky four day weekend, those naughty Victorians. So uh, we'll, we, we might be a few of those on the border, on the border towns as well, who knows. Nonetheless, it looks like we've probably got a quorum now. Um, so yes, once again, thanks everybody to joining today to the Drug and Alcohol Research and Innovation Active Learning Network, uh, with, or DARIA for short. Um, Today, we are lucky enough to be joined by Dr. James Blog. Um, and before I talk about his topic, uh, I just wanted to introduce him. So I, I know I've worked extensively with Dr. Blog, but um, he is a public health physician who began working with people who inject drugs in the context of HIV prevention and treatment after returning from Africa in the early 1990s, and more recently worked on an HIV prevention program in Indonesia for eight years as a harm reduction for taking up the role as clinical director of population health at Justice Health uh, and Forensic Mental Health Network. He is currently over at Drug Health Services at Sydney LHD as a, Sydney staff, a senior staff specialist uh, based at Canterbury and Concord Hospitals. And over over on the that side of town there is certainly uh, a high prevalence of uh, performance and imaging enhancement and so he has a particular interest in that area and he's going to talk today about what you know what should health services be doing so thanks very much james it's my uh, my pleasure and uh before we kick off i should acknowledge where we're meeting on category lands of the aurora nation um also want to wish everyone a happy halloween and i Guess some of you might be uh, uh, interested in uh, acting out as uh, as a, painting yourself green and acting out as a Hulk or She Hulk. Well, I'd say good luck with that. Maybe next year you could put some of this uh, content to advice. Okay, so I'm talking about performance and imaging and imaging enhancing drugs, and hopefully we'll talk a little bit about what health services could or should be doing, um, and which is a controversial topic, I guess, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see what we get to from with that. Uh, why am I not going down? Okay, Chris. Oh, just use the uh, the right arrow key. You should, um, and that should. It's not, it's not going, I'm just. You can also just try click. You reckon, yeah, there we go. Okay, Beautiful. work beautifully. Okay, so you can see a, a very famous muscle band uh, uh, Australian man there who uh, I think his wife said in his latest Hollywood appearance he was too big and uh, we could sort of hypothesise why that might be. Um, I'll talk a bit about background to why people use these drugs, what they are, patterns of use, risks and issues, maybe a little bit about assessment. I, I want to talk about the sort of big five, the most popular of the, the steroids that are used and, and importantly, what people do to control the side effects of cycles or coming off cycles, if that's what they're, they're doing, which is less common these days, actually, and a bit about peptides and other, other agents. So I've got a case study and then we can sort of discuss a bit about, um, about solutions. So you can hear this is the before picture and really, you know, my imagination struggles to see, uh, you know, and I 
lift weights, very small weights, but lift weights. And uh, it certainly doesn't matter how much physical activity I do, I just become wiry. And I suggest that is probably the case for most people. I first became, and Chris was just asking me about this, first aware of this when I started work at Canterbury and uh, uh, Prof Haber said to me, well, what's the major issue out there? And I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea that, that the harm minimization program, which has had a unnecessarily distant relationship with drug health, gave out 1.3 uh, syringes annually, and most of them identified, most of the, the, uh, the clients identified as, as PEDS users, people who use PEDS. And there's been a bit of a, an impact of COVID. As you can see, um, over the course of the last couple of years, a um, few changes that I, if you use your imagination, you can, well, you can see that occasions of service actually have increased amongst the PEDS group. Um, and occasions of service, have sort of, they, they sort of peaked at the worst part of COVID. But it, it, you know, I guess my point is that a really ongoing issue at, at Canterbury uh, uh, harm minimisation, and and maybe later I can talk about some of the issues around that with that that sort of model that's being used. So I, I won't talk much about this. I think you all know there are three types of steroids. We're talking about the first group: cortisol, prednisone, glucocorticosteroids. Not really talking about them, and then. Uh, mineral cortico, uh, corticosteroids um, from the adrenals as well. And I hope you're not getting too much background noise there. Um, and anabolic steroids, um, they alter testosterone by prolonging its effects and they also act on androgen receptors to uh, increase uh, tissue production. Uh, and exercise actually increases the receptors uh, receptor availability. They also actually block, block the uh, catabolism uh, process uh, by blocking uh, cortisol. And the doses are quite high usually used. And they, you know, the doses people tend to use of, 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 of the, uh, the testosterone or the analogs tend to be sort of five to 10 times what would be used in a sort of medical setting. And we can see here... Uh, uh, Marion Jones, who uh, you know, I was lucky enough to see her run in, in in Sydney, won three gold medals, but had to uh, later pass that back for a range of uh, uh, steroids that she was using, uh, you know, including uh, insulin. But uh, so you know, many many famous athletes have participated in that. While we're sort of before we get going, I'll just show this chart. This comes from a great article by Bonnacay's, or you know. Although the, the sort of conclusions they this group gives on harm reduction, I really don't agree with, and you know we'll, we'll talk a bit later about that, which is really this sort of cessation message. But if you look at this chart, you can see three main groups of injectables and three of oral: uh, the testosterone C seventeen esters, most famously the blend of sort of natural esters that Sustanon two hundred and fifty, very popular uh, type of testosterone. So I'll be talking about that group. Um, in detail, and also talking about the 19 uh, nor testosterones, uh, decadurabolin and, and a tren or trenbolin uh, um, is uh, also uh, a topic of our uh, discussion, and also the DHT, the dihydro uh, testosterone derivatives of, of which um, um, uh, androlol, uh, anadrol is is a, uh, a, a very famous uh, uh, and popular variant of, of that group. Oral are also uh, important, um, tend not to be quite so much, but, you saw quite so, but Dianabol is, is, is one of the more popular uh, varieties there, but you've got some equivalency there. They, they tend to be more expensive to use and sort of don't give quite the same kick, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail. So I guess you've all probably heard a bit about stacking we are combining, you know, as I said, oral and injected often combined, and, and this is sort of different types, strength, bulk, and cutting, cycling on and off for sort of eight to 12 year, weeks and then up to allow recovering. Um, pyramiding, where you're sort of increasing and decreasing dose, so not without really stopping. That's more common, but really these days, most people blast and cruise. So they have a, a stable um, regimen. They don't ever stop but they might add extra stuff at different times. And then as they get 
side effects, they'll have the PCT, the post-cycle therapy uh, and supplements for, for side effects. Um, using, you know, the selective androgen receptor modulators, peptides, and, and insulin is also used, although I won't be talking so much about that, but insulin can be used as did Marion Jones, where they, it, it promotes nutrient storage and, and prevention of cell breakdown also promotes muscle mass. So wide range of things that, that can be done. And we're certainly, I'm not going to make the experts through this talk, but we'll just touch on most of the major issues. Which are, and the one that concerns me most is how poorly engaged this group of people are by the health system. And I, I think a lot of it's our attitude to this particular group of, of uh, people who use drugs. About a quarter or possibly even less uh, are medically monitored. Um, and they really believe what they're doing is healthy and that's their perspective and they're entitled to that perspective. About... 25% do use other illicit drugs. That probably more these days, I would, I would hazard a guess. And, and certainly my experience, although I guess my, my experience is biased because I'm, I'm tending to see people who are using other drugs as well as, um, as, as PEDS. The variable, variable quality in the products and poor inject, injection practices. So, you know, people do come with get contaminated products or, or mislabeled products because they're bought illicitly, like all our patients abscesses, bacterial infections, acute reactions. Um, these are common and you know, I've had many stories from patients about these. Although the rates of hepatitis in this group tend to be low, according to the needle syringe uh, uh, survey, which is a very powerful instrument. And they, they generally believe the BBV transmission issue is irrelevant in the sort of more pet, pure PEDS user. So, it's, that's quite a difficult conversation to have. You've got to be a bit careful with that. Whereas in in traditional groups, and you know, Chris was referring before about the you know the jail setting, you know, really standard part of our work, and as it should be in the community to to deal with Hep C. But in this group, they they tend to like, well, no, that's not our responsibility, and it, and it, it, it isn't it isn't something I really identify with, even though it is important to touch base on. So I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to focus on the major risks apart from the side effects, but I would just like to just touch on them now, cardiovascular risk is really important in this group. And especially they get this big left ventricle, um, which doesn't work that well. So they have a lowered ejection fraction. They get a whole sort of range of cardiovascular risks and hypertension, which can result in the doubling of their mortality and morbidity. And a lot of this is, is to do with the, the distorted um, triglyceride and, and uh, um, uh, HDL, LDL balance changes. Uh, with the oral alkylated, uh, uh, alkylated compounds, um, hepatotoxicity can occur. And this 17-methyl group is not degraded for first pass um, hepatic uh, metabolism, which causes toxicity. The, the, the sort of physical aspect of the bulking up can cause joint-related injury, and I'll, I'll talk specifically about the, the, the agents that can particularly do this, but muscle mass, you know, people like to sometimes increase muscle mass in, in isolation and uh, the stewards can directly work in the tendons and some, some guys, you know, might have damaging routines. Um, Erythropoietin is used, which, and, and that and other agents can cause, cause polycythemia and, and thrombosis and there, is, there are increased rates of uh, infarction. I think this is a topic you uh, this diagram, I think you'd all be familiar with, with the uh, hypothalamus uh, pituitary axis, and, and the sort of typical picture. Where if you if you look at their um, uh, testosterone levels, is it, the testosterone tends to be high when they're you know on a cycle or um, and with with depressed levels of the uh, sex hormone, so the uh, LH and FSH, um, and. Uh, with men, there's still an issue with this, um, uh, with estrogens and, and progesterone, um, where you get this um, aromatization, so testosterone being converted, um, which is another issue as well. You can do a lot of investigations on, 
on these people. I find it's really just hard to uh, capture them and maintain it, let alone do this in a systematic way. And, you know, ideally you do it the same part of the cycle. And I was assisting one of our partners the other day and we had a whole range of results on the testosterone because of when it had been done and, and when they'd been uh, uh, using different agents at different times. But testosterone and the LHFSH are very useful um, to to look at the degree of the um, uh, hypothalamus pituitary axis suppression and, and also to quantify the uh, degree of use. I mentioned cholesterol and tri tri triglycerides, which is really important from uh, um, a monitoring point of view and, and to uh, state those ongoing risks, GH, cortisol, the TSH, they're getting prostate problems. PSAs are probably uh, important as they get older. Generally, looking at the uh, you know LFTs and, and other uh, um, standard testing is for ECG is a good thing to do, and and you know of course monitoring the blood pressure. And uh, due to the um, left ventricular hyper hypertrophy, uh, ACE or um, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers can be uh, uh, useful to use for the. So um, this is what I like to do at the beach, frolic in the waves like that. Um, objectives of page use. So bulking is, is really a, a highly, highly thought of activity for most um, to build you know, large amounts of muscle and often uh, used in off season when they're sort of eating up. Although I've got, there's a couple of patients we look after who are unusual and they just really use sort of the six months a year to actually get a beach body. Um, and then there's the cutting steroids, um, you know, especially people are coming up to a, uh, a, a competition to, to burn fat and uh, increase definition and whilst re retaining the hypertrophy uh, when a more calorie deficit. And uh, um, women, uh, a little bit of a special case. In, we were chatting about the, the milk, and there's a lot of good work being done on this in, in Victoria. And Matthew Dunn's group, uh, did this recently at APSAD where they talked about a small study they did where they looked at, uh, they interviewed coaches, gym owners and athletes to, to look at. And, and what's interesting, because of the testing regimens in women's elite sport, it, it doesn't appear um, that peds are a big issue, according to this, this group of interviewees. Uh, but in strength sports, so, you know, you've really got two broad categories here. And, that, you know, and we can talk a bit about the sort of natural history of this use across male athletes when testing came in and things changed but in the in the uh in the strength sports and the uh un, un, untested um, sports women uh, were more vulnerable they found to, to coaches say oh yeah you look it'd be one to use a bit of this this would be good and they'd, they'd really feel under pressure to uh, to uh to use these regimens okay so we'll just talk a little bit about some of the big uh, the big five, what I'd call, uh, of, uh, of steroids. And the most popular uh, steroid, uh, oral steroid, and made famous by uh, uh, that uh, a fa a famous uh, Californian governor, um, was actually created by an American. And this guy was drinking in a bar and uh, was talking, I think, to the coach of the Russian team and realised they were using a lot of testosterone. And uh, that's why they were starting to really, uh, American uh, weightlifting just couldn't compete with, with the Russians at that time. And he realized something had to be done. So, you know, he, he developed this, uh, this agent and it was found to be more anabolic uh, uh, than testosterone and was able to give America the ascendancy. Thank God for that. And, uh, you know, it had, but it had over double the anabolic rating than compared to testosterone and, it is, it is, as I said, it is an oral steroid and it um, is an, there is an injectable version. High gains in uh, muscle gain, not very androgenic, which was good, but as I mentioned earlier, hepatotoxic with this uh, C17 um, alpha alkylated, uh, which causes um, risk of liver damage um, over large, uh, longer, longer periods of use. You get high blood pressure, um, and you get this exogenous testosterone and the hepatic lipase stimulation, a bit of water retention, and also this distorted um, uh, LDL uh, and HDL levels um, where the um, 
exogenous testosterone raises estrogen levels to regulate the, the cholesterol and the testosterone spikes the LDL cholesterol while the high estrogen spikes the HDL. So it's a bit of a disaster there. And then also the hepatic lipase further lowers the HDL and can give you a bit of blood pressure issues and gynecomastia. So this is where the, and the selective um, estrogen receptor modulators can be used and especially tamoxifen. So tamoxifen is very good at um, working peripherally um, to block the uh, estrogen receptors. And so that can be quite used, uh, useful to be to use to, to control that, um, you know, often on post cycle or during cycles. So here's the um, the big one. So testosterone itself, and it's been used a long time, and originally extracted from bulls' test testicles. Of course, everything's made synthetically now. I think. Um, although I think that was the nicest photo I could find. I think they're actually goats' testicles. So please. Um, uh, um, Bear with me. Uh, the uh, large gains in muscle strength and size, uh, and from a cycle, uh, you know, you can get put on a lot of muscle. Um, milder compound than Dynabol uh, with less uh, cardiovascular and hepatic risks, risks it, it tends to be injectable, um, but with a high androgen rating. So the hair loss, the prostate enlargement. And this was a real issue that that um, uh, Ziegler found with the with the Russians. They were all getting these prostate problems as, as a part of the uh, big, uh, big testosterone uh, doses they were having. Promotes fat loss uh, due to the androgen receptors reducing lipid uptake and also stimulates lipolysis and burns fat, builds large amount of muscle. But it is relatively safe, um, you know, compared to others because it is a natural form. And uh, as I said, sustenon's a, a forester mix, uh, relatively affordable because you, you don't have to use this daily, whereas in a um, oral form you would. Um, and but the androgenic actually leads to hair loss, acne, gynecomastia. So this is a, is aromatized, um, where the testosterone is converted to the estradiol, and the uh, androstenodione uh, is 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 also converted to uh, estrogen itself. So that that's a real problem. Um, testosterone suppression and continues post cycle. So you know, often these levels stay stay down for a long time um, if they're if they're cycling. Um, and injections can be uh, a bit uncomfortable, especially with the propionate, uh, which is injected every usually a couple of times a week. Um, the entonate and the uh, cipionate popular because you can get away with every two or three weeks. Most of the people, I've got a bit of a mix of what people prefer to use, whether it's this twice weekly or weekly or fortnightly. Anadrol. Um, this was developed in the 50s, late 50s, chronically underweight patients. And again, you get these very big, um, big strength enhancement, monstrous levels, as they say. And this is where people can, you know, lift too heavy and, and as we talked about earlier, rupture tendons and torn muscles and you really need to go slowly and do more reps rather than, you know, these big weights that are people tempted to do. Um, and, uh, you know, with these, these uh, uh, quite big doses, you get sharp rises in blood pressure. Again, the fluid retention. Uh, testosterone levels with cell counts um, and uh, again stimulates hepatic lipase and then especially problematic if people are using alcohol with this it doesn't aromatize um, so we're just talking about sort of peripheral use so it's not converting the um, converting to estrogens but it it does have um, with issues you can um, use the, the serums, the, we talked about earlier, tamoxifen working peripherally, but comophane is really useful for re-establishing the uh, pituitary uh, acid. So that people often use those together in this sort of setting. Water retention um, can be managed by lowering calories. Uh, this is one that people often use before a competition look really big and uh, um, with the uh, sodium intake and water accumulation, and then the muscle sh shrinks when you when you cease the uh, the regimen. Um, androgenic hair loss, thinning, and oily skin, and they get this quite big crash post um, post cycle with the natural suppression. So 
been generally used sort of shorter, shorter cycles of this. Trend, trend following. So this is the aesthetic. Well, people like the, this sort of look of this lean mass sort of dries out the um, uh, the muscles a bit, so you get this sort of ripped appearance. Um, you know, not the sort of not the bulk look, but then really ripped appearance. And and again, you get these sort of antenate and uh, 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 acetate uh, forms injectable. Um, and you get you get the sort of muscle ga uh, gains like adenabol and anadrol without the water retention. And uh, it, what it does, it reduces the extracellular fluid around the muscles, and uh, you get this sort of vascularity as, as seen in this picture. And this guy's a bit pink as well, which is part of the uh, pattern. Potent fat burner, high, highly androgenic, stimulates androgen receptors for lipolysis and, you know, very uh, androgenic compared to testosterone, but with this powerful strength enhancement, uh, you know, explosive power, uh, which athlete, athletes uh, seek and uh, and has a rapid impact. So you get this, these huge gains coming up to a comp. Um, uh, Half-life, uh, 11 days. So, again, less frequent injections uh, and really, as I said earlier, causes testosterone to really shut right down. And so needs this sort of powerful uh, post-cycle therapy. You get this sort of sweating as well, the trend sweats. And it gives this sort of CNS arousal, which you know, is sort of very much in the popular press, this sort of insomnia, anxiety, depression, and they, if they have energy drinks, it can get even worse. And this sort of temper and irritability or even paranoia. And there's this sort of strange cough, which is not quite, not clearly understood, but they think it's probably prostagen, uh, prostaglandin uh, mediated with this androgenic effect and or possibly direct irritation in the, in the arterioles and the lining with these micro uh, pulmonary emboli. And uh, there's actually been reports of an AMI related to this sort of effect by, uh, uh, by a trend user and also the severe androgenic side effects, uh, yeah, acne and hair loss. Another one that was very popular, very old school and, uh, you know, much loved by our uh, Californian governor, um, Decadrabalin and or an andrelin. Uh, this main benefit to, is what muscle and strength gains, and you, you get an extra uh, uh, ten. You get ten kg as we said on Dynabol, but with this you you could get fifty to seventy five percent more, and uh, very popular traditionally stacked with that. It, it's a bit underrated these days, and it was sort of what the um, what the golden era used a bit, and and uh, you know I'll refer to this a moment, but the you know the, the good hair they've still got because they you know it doesn't have the uh, the same issues. Injectable long esters, slow in, um, impact and uh, slow onset, and but powerful enough to get big gains. And as I said, can be stacked with a number of the other agents. Increases collagen synthesis, fluid retention. So as I said, not androgenic. So and and women can use this without the same issues of virilization. Raises the blood pressure a bit more, um, but not liver toxicity, erectile dysfunction. This sort of decadric uh, dick is um, is uh, probably related to the prolactin level, which reduces the libido in men. And um, if uh, if endogenous testosterone levels are low, the androgenic pro uh, properties can uh, uh, can actually maintain sexual performance. So it depends on the sort of balance they have. Um, what they've found is the DHT actually has a role in nitric oxide production, the blood flow to the penis. So um, the, the sexual performance issues are worse if um, when DEC is used on its own, and so. What people often do is, is use it with an androgenic bulking steroid and uh, uh, these supplements with the uh, uh, Kappa Goline, uh, this dubinergic uh, in cycles, and this inhibits the prolactin and, and helps maintain libido. And this can cause, uh, also cause gynecomastia. It's not, not uh, 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 estrogenic, but let me just turn that off. Um, um, but the SERMs, the uh, selective estrogen uh, receptor modulators, um, 
can uh, exacerbate uh, progesterone levels. So this is where you use one of these uh, aromatase inhibitors. And this is the most popular drug now. It's quite interesting uh, uh, in terms of uh, controlling symptoms. Uh, um, anastrozole, Armadex, and uh, that can be effective, can cause issues with blood pressure though. And testosterone production, also an issue post-cycle if, if people are cycling on and off. Some reasons I can't explain, I have frozen. Ah, here we go, all good. So what's the best steroid? It's, one, it's a very strange question, but look, it depends on their goal. And um, if they want lots of mass, Dynabol, Anadrol, want a lean bulk, of course, you know, trend is the way to go. But really safety, testosterone, especially, you know, used in very uh, judicial doses. I've got one patient that does this and, you know, he's, he's used a lot of different versions and he really just uses a bit of testosterone every week or two and he finds that that works for him. Although he, he stopped letting me, I, I look after a number of his issues, but I, he stopped letting me... Um, review his bloods because he sort of thinks he's okay. And these are different stacking examples. I won't go through all these, but you can see that, you know, the world you, world you oyster, you can really do whatever you like uh, by combining, but people generally stack something like this is other uh, sort of patterns people have as well as the other things they'd be using. Um, very important, the post-cycle therapy. And I think this is one way that we could all potentially get involved. Uh, and this is to preserve the physiological, psychological health and retain the gains coming off a cycle or even during, during the, in the cruising and blasting. And this is, as I said, to address the estrogen and the latter side effects. If you're cycling, they generally wait a week post-cycle, but if you're using a psalm, and please try not to confuse the psalms and the serms. So the psalm, the psalm is the, uh, so like the androgen modulator. So ligandrol uh, is, is most famous. And you've got uh, Shane the Jacks, the uh, Australian swimmer who was given a four-year ban for uh, having contaminated uh, urine with uh, ligandrol. She subsequently appealed and got it reduced to two years, um, claiming it was in a supplement. I'm not sure how she proved that. But you can see she's there contemplating her two-year ban. Um, testosterone, it's a testosterone analog. It's got uh, beneficial androgenic effects, traditionally used for uh, prostate cancer, and, you know, without the osteoporosis and muscle loss and um, uh, selective stimulation and blocking on the uh, androgen receptors. And so this one you can use straight after um, ceasing a cycle if that's what you want to do. Um, but more commonly, the, the selective uh, estrogen receptor modulators, and I mentioned clom uh, clomiphene working on the hypothalamus with pituitary access and causes these um, uh, increases in LH and FSH to come back to normal, and, and but does lead to potentially cardiovascular side effects and thrombosis. And, and I mentioned before, tamoxifen binds to the estrogen receptors peripherally. So I noticed that. Um, have an issue with aromatizing, uh, and the, this enzyme is actually inhibited by uh, binding to the to the heme uh, by the arbidex, uh, and this increases the, uh, increasing use, minimise the conversion of uh, testosterone to estradiol, and also increase the anabolic effects, which is interesting and especially useful if you're using this with testosterone or, or DECA, uh, where the uh, where the uh, uh, estrogen receptor modulators are, are uh, less effective. This is a new class. This is a huge area, peptides, and, and really you could just do a whole talk talking about these. Um, short chains of amino acids linked by peptide bonds and a huge variety of classes and families, um, especially the growth hormone secretagogues, um, which facilitate growth hormone release to act on the myocytes and promote the muscle fibers. So these are fast acting, they're expensive. Problem is they're usually injected and often daily. So it's a real commitment. Most of the people I've seen would do this for a while and get sick of it. They get great gains. And one guy said, even, you know, this guy was, had a similar hairstyle to mine. And he said, look, I got my hair back. It was great. But he just, just couldn't, couldn't sustain it. I don't think we probably need that overview. Okay, well, I'll talk a little bit about one of my patients 
and this guy was sort of continuing to try and work with them. As I said, I, one of the real issues we've got is to keep this group of patients engaged because they really, you know, like to do their thing and, and really are not that interested unless they've got a lot of issues. And as I referred to that article earlier, really that article's message is really, well, don't give these people anything, uh, but if they um, having problems, use that as a, you know, an argument to get them to stop. And that has not been my experience. So this guy, 43-year-old guy, and um, he's, he was currently, when he came to us on metazapine for a couple of years um, and also used a bit of diazepam for, for panic and anxiety. Um, he'd he'd uh, had a separation with his partner a couple of years ago and um, had been referred to a psychologist but didn't follow this up. You know, drank a little bit, not a big deal. Never actually been tested for hepatitis C. We managed to do that. Worked in the wedding industry, um, uh, entertainment, and uh, that was coming back after COVID. I uh, had a couple of kids um, who we were starting to see again after the separation. But had been on cycles for nearly 12 years. So he used intermittently for a few years and then continuously for the past five years or so. He was on testosterone um, using a, an ester mix of the enthanate and the uh, uh, propionate, um, which he used twice weekly, and also used the uh, boldenon um, twice weekly as well, both injected, and, and also Dynabol uh, was um, using, it was cycling on that. He was using um, the sort of supplements, and the supplement area, again, is a huge area, and the stuff that's in it, you, you know, probably remember the Essendon Football Club, and we just talked about Shane and Jacks there, you know. What's in these supplements, you know, they often have listened, you, you know, it, be, it is useful to go through what's in them. But um, he was um, using that one and also this rule one protein shake. And he said he used this previous one and they'd, they'd go to the back of the shop and get this one out called the eye, which he said was sort of very mysterious compound, but it caused penile numbness. So he stopped using that. And he'd, he'd um, also used growth hormone in the past and he found that actually decreased his training performance. When we looked at his bloods, at a mild elevation of his, uh, uh, of his transaminases and uh, moderately elevated testosterone uh, with, with the lower, low uh, LH and FSH. Um, and he had really pretty awful looking uh, cholesterol and triglycerides. Um, he really hadn't altered, wasn't interested in altering his steroid use, continuously blasting and cruising. Um, had this emotional breakdown three years earlier where his mom and his, his friend had died quite close to, uh, in, to this, the, at the, the same time and, and then had a marital breakdown and actually was admitted to Canterbury Hospital and, and that's when he was started on the metazapine. Um, felt pretty stable. His anxiety attacks weren't too bad and his depression was okay. Um, so one of me to liaise with his, his GP about going on a statin and doing that in the way that he could manage and also consider changing him from metazapine for sort of metabolic and also hopefully anxiety control to an SSRI. And he came back to see me and he said, oh, the GP just threw your, threw your letter in the bin, which was an unusual experience. And, and he said, that, yeah, the GP just told me to become a vegan, which I thought was interesting uh, um, uh, way to, to deal with the subject. But he, um, he, he was increasingly anxious when we saw him. Um, he, he sort of tried reducing his metazapine and sort of put it up again and was, was, the panic attacks were a bit worse. Um, mood was okay. So we decided to, to switch him to sertraline and, and he was seeing his kids. That was all good and wanted to start the statin. Um, and... The, my research partner for this is the, um, the GP liaison in alcohol and drugs um, who has, has great interest and also great knowledge in this area. And she was, gonna, she was actively involved in finding another GP and we we're going to repeat his bloods. On the statin, his, his bloods look fantastic. Um, and he, this was even before he got to sort of the full therapeutic dose. Um, and uh, he hadn't changed his steroid use. Um, everything was pretty much the same. But he, he did decide to go back on growth hormone. Um, but he, he stopped after a few weeks because he had this numbness to his hands. 
Um, but his move was much better on the central lane. So we decided to put his, his dose up and we were going to swap him to a more hy hydrophilic statin for hopefully less muscle and joint pain with that. And he had a, a new uh, uh, new GP with Glad. I think he's had a few issues subsequently. I haven't seen him for a little while, but, you know, that's a sort of typical process. And, you know, we, we engaged him pretty well for a couple of years there. Harm reduction. So there's no agreed approach to this. I, I guess the sort of, when I was thinking about this, there are really three groups. There's, you know, a few guys and, and women see their uh, GPs, get their serology monitored, um, generally without the, the GP knowing too much about it. Um, those that have spent the specialists, uh, endocrinologists typically, um, Tend to just get get the uh, uh, get short thrift. They get really are told, look, you, you, what you're doing is very bad. Please stop. Uh, otherwise, I won't look after you. That's pretty much the, the attitude from most endocrinologists. And then there's a handful of rogue prescribers, what I'd call rogue prescribers, who and these guys are financially motivated and would um, I guess see people post cycle and say, oh look, low testosterone, they need testosterone and use that as a justification. And they maybe have one consult and the rest to be phone consults and, and really using it as a income generating activity. Um, and I might be a bit unsympathetic there, but that you know they're not really providing the sort of comprehensive care that this group probably needs. Um, range of strategies available. And as I said before, it tends to be um, using the side effects and the serious health issues to coerce pa patients into cessation. And really, of all the patients I've seen, they have absolutely no interest in ceasing. And, and really, you know, if I think about all the patients I see um, in terms of their identity and, you know, identity of heroin user or poly drug user or whatever they they sort of identify with this group of, of drug users, um, the people that use PEDS really identify. They feel really good about what they're doing. They feel good about their body. They feel good about the effects. Um, they might moderate it a bit by, by cycling, but they really, you know, they essentially, you know, don't see it any of my, you know, they don't see my business as, as advising them to cease. And um, I really believe, and, and we're, I'll talk a bit about our research aims, which have been very much stymied by COVID, but we can really only assist these people if we engage in the service the same way that, you know, we had a conversation with Alex about, um, you know, the stimulant program that the Vince has had and, and offering, uh, um, you know, stimulant prescribing in the same way just to engage people. I think it's the same model, but for some reason we've resisted doing it with this, this particular group, group of patients. So. If you're wanting to prescribe testosterone, and you know, we're looking at the PBS criteria, you know they're very, very clear. I mean, it would be all uh, on a private script because um, it's testosterone androgen deficiency due to established testicular disease or pituitary failure. It's got to be verified by a specialist, either an endocrinologist, urologist, or a sexual health physician, and there has to be persistently low serum testosterone. So you, you know, you you really. You'd be sailing close to the wind, I think, probably putting it on the PBS. And similarly with the aromatase inhibitors and the CERMs, um, really for managing high estrogen levels with the criteria of breast cancer hormone, but the receptor positive. So we sort of can't, you know, we can't sort of slip this in on the PBS. So our research program, so really the idea was to engage, we've got people in the Canterbury area um, there are a lot of gyms out west. Um, I think there's about 30 or so very close by to Canterbury within a couple of Ks. And there's also the Lebanese Muslim Association. They've got Optimus Gym. They're very active as well. And, and in fact, one of the big gyms, we actually have a program with, um, with, with mental health as well with Canterbury Hospital. So that, that exact uh, relationship previously already exists. So the plan was to, uh, you know, we've, we've individually, individually <laughs> engaged people um, uh, for follow-up through, uh, largely through uh, uh, Zara, the uh, uh, gladness uh, and other referrals. And sometimes, you know, patients, you know, when you take a careful history, you'll, you'll pick this up and be able to continue to engage them on, on this basis. In fact, one patient I've seen tomorrow was actually admitted um, 
uh, to the detox um, and all the spiders actually for alcohol withdrawal, which we've done another one recently, albeit as an outpatient. And the staff were horrified because he actually brought all his injecting equipment in to continue it. And he thought that was completely reasonable to continue his uh, cycle as, a, as a, an inpatient. Um, unfortunately, they were confiscated, but I, for a whole range of reasons, he's largely curtailed his, his, um, his peach use. So the plan is then to carry out focus group discussions across the key gyms to get a good sample of, of um, uh, patient responses as to what we should be doing for services and then enable large numbers of patients to engage in, in health services um, in the Canterbury area. And, and as I said, my, my view would be to have a more harmonisation approach rather than an emphasis on cessation, which is generally what exists for this group. So just in general, at the end, I, you know, work with the patient's GPs if you can, even though it doesn't always work out. Uh, encourage regular monitoring, really gentle advice. Patients know a lot, and I really know a lot more than you probably ever will know about this, this topic. Although a lot of things are um, pretty un scientific, you know, I've, I've a couple of my patients have been on finasteride, the uh, testosterone blocker, and I've been very curious about that. And, and uh, uh, you know, so they, they, a lot of odd things, it's often quite unscientific. So you, you, once you get to know them, you can start to offer a little bit of advice on them. They'll, they'll usually pay some attention to that. And don't assume ignorance of injecting, you know, but by all means cover this out. I mean, this patient I referred to earlier who was using the testosterone, you know, I one day I said to him, well, where do you actually do the subcutaneous injections? And he, and he pointed right next to his um, umbilicus. I said, well, that's probably not the best spot. And we talked a bit about, you know, where to do a subcut. So, but, you know, you, you really want to work your way into that, uh, that discussion because they, they're really very, um, very confident about their practices, even though they, the way they might be, um, uh, their educational pathway is not the same as, as, as ours or our other patients. Look, I'll leave it there and um, look, thanks for your attention and uh, look forward to your questions and discussion on this, uh, this matter. Thanks very much, James. I, um, so please everybody, uh, I, for those who are usually here, you'll know that I often dominate proceedings with questions and so forth. And I'll do it again today if people don't jump in with questions because I do find this really, really interesting area um, and as we were talking about before, um, you know, there, there are, um, you know, there's, it's not just in New South Wales, you know, there's a group down in Victoria who've got that you that you have alluded to as well that are, that are doing some really interesting work uh, in this space as well. Um, so please, everybody jump in and uh, post your questions in the chat or, um, or, or whatever else. Um, while we're doing that, I, I wanted to um, well, firstly, I'll make one comment. I, I tend to agree about the unsympathetic uh, towards the uh, those 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 prescribers that, as you say, maybe check check it once and then continue on with their testosterone kind of indefinitely. Um, but um, I, somebody once sent me a an intro, and I've been trying very hard to find it while I've been sitting here about the four different uh, personalities of of people who use performance enhancing drugs and. Uh, I, if I remember one of them was, you know, there was the scientist, there was the, there was like the, the there was the beach one, which I think you alluded to as well. Um, have you, do you, firstly, are you familiar with that? And secondly, is there, I mean, do you find that there are those, they fit into those stereotypes? Oh, not really. I mean, I guess I, the, the group I would see, I would see those that are very much poly drug users and they happen to be used peds as well. And this one guy I referred to, I've actually known him since jail. I actually met him in Silverwater Prison. Um, and so I've known him a long, long time. And, you know, essentially he's doing very well. He's also on sublocate. But the um, uh, one of the issues, just while we're touching on that topic, is when we were scaling up depot in the prison system, I became aware of the issues with bodybuilding. And this is, you know, not so much access especially since COVID to, to these drugs in jail but certainly the bodybuilding and, and there was a lot of issues with um 
with using Bouvardal and people increasing the degradation process by their heavy workouts. And I really struggled to, to deal with that very well uh, with, with Kerma Prison. And this guy was really struggled a bit. And he was a, um, uh, he operates a crane. And whilst he fell out in it, he, he would go down and do the rigging. And when he went down to the rigging, he'd be in the sun, he'd be working very hard and he'd have he'd really go very flat on his boot iron. He's done very well on Sublocade. So I'd say Sublocade probably goes very well with this group of patients compared to Bermudale. But um, so, so that'd be one group, sort of the poly drug users or those that have opioid or, or other, other drug issues. And the other group would be the pure um, referred through the sort of GP network of... Um, of steroid uses, I'm really not so interested in, in, in using other drugs. And you know, I might flirt with, as I said, insulin or peptides or, or other things, but I find them all pretty scientific, you know, in, in their sort of their attempts to, to do so, to, uh, to sort of balance their regimen. And they're, they're usually, as I said, pretty interested um, in, in what I've got to say and, you know, my interpretation of their bloods. And as long as you, you, they feel you're working with them, I think that's a really... You know, like all our patients, productive relationship. Yeah, no, and and look, I think whenever you you as a as a clinician ask a question and and let them be the expert, it can go a long way to to assisting with that. Where you're actually, you know, in the particularly in the drug world, I've certainly asked a lot of times. Well, what is, you know, what's a snow cone? I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, and and you know, and in the same way, you know, you can ask. Well, what's what's that one? And 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 there's just so much complexity to it. I think that that's a good way to, to chat to people about it's it. overwhelming i mean i still look at my notes and think hang on what is this guy trying to do you know <laughs> it, it really is it you know because a lot of it and i would encourage you if you're interested in this area to have a look at some of the chat rooms and this sort of the way the advice comes out and it's it's well it's a little bit bizarre i mean it, it's certainly not scientific but the people have a lot of experience so it, it very much experience based on what people do in their decision making but yep. it, when you when you enter into this area, it is very humbling um, because you know in drug health we tend to feel we know a bit about what we're doing in this area. I still don't feel I know very much about what I'm doing. I'm really you know, I'm, and, and I guess that's one of the things that that keeps me in drug health because I do like learning from my patients. This is an area you really do learn a lot. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There was some um, sort of a uh, another question here from um, uh, someone online. How do we combat healthcare worker stigma towards people who use um, performance enhancing uh, and image enhancing drugs, uh, especially healthcare workers providing needle syringe uh, and guidelines around needle syringe programs for uh, performance enhancing drugs? Did you want to comment on that one at all? James? Oh, look, I mean, I think it's a, that's a that's an oldie but a goodie, really, about any needle syringe programs. And that time, I. I, uh, I spent in Indonesia was very good at sort of promoting needle syringe for any use and really just that safe injecting is, is very important and the more safe injecting we can have is better. But, you know, I think all our patients deserve, deserve access to good health care and, you know, it's as simple as that and I think uh, we've really just got to re-educate the workforce. I think that this is a completely legitimate part of our, um, our patient group. Um, th you'll have to forgive me if I've um, perhaps taken the wrong end of the stick with this part. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the post-cycle therapy, so tamoxifen and, and so forth. Um, and again, you'll, ha you'll have to forgive me because I'm probably going down the medicinal hierarchy and that you th mm -hmm. I think to myself, a tablet's not as bad as <laughs> injecting something. Uh, there is some work on that uh, out there in the ether. Um, I mean, apart in my head, I can't help but think, I mean, is this something that perhaps we, I'm not saying I will be doing this, but maybe people would offer in the future. Um, we, 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 no, you don't think so? No, absolutely. No, oh, I, couldn't it... more, I, I couldn't agree more, Chris. I mean, look, my, 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 my dream would be, and happy to do this, you know, with you and Josh in the future, but is, is that we... Um, get a significant evidence base from our patients saying, look, we will engage in treatments if you offer this, this, and this. We put that up as a, a phase two of the uh, research and we start prescribing. I think that's, you know, I think, um, I think that's a completely reasonable thing to do. I think it's far safer that we're involved as directly as possible that rather than, um, than uh, people self-medicating. And, and, you know, especially if they're getting good advice, good monitoring, uh, rather than doing their own thing, as long as they, you know, they feel you're accessible and reasonable, I, I, I think that's, 
I don't think we've got a choice here, actually. And and I guess by the at the same time, uh, by doing that, those people would then exclude themselves from you know major sporting competitions and those things. Well, of course, yeah, I think that I, I look. I think that I I think that's a bit of a furphy, really, because people doing serious sports they'll get caught out. I mean, unless they're very good and they've got very very high level advisors, which you know clearly some people have had and, and will continue to have. Um, Look, I don't think that's our role. I think, you know, if, if people want to do what they want to do, you know, it's in the same way that our patients might be participating in all sorts of crime around their drug use dealing or associated um, crime to support that. That's that's really none of our business unless we're aware of, you know, major crime taking place. So, you know, I don't see that as a, uh, in any way, as a, as a barrier. No, that's in, it's interesting. And look, I, I take it you've probably seen the documentary Bigger, Faster, Stronger, which um, kind of talks a bit about the how the um, performance enhancing drugs is, in, is something we've created through our own desire for athletes to do more oh, and look, more. I, it's interesting that that came up with Marion Jones, because I remember when I was at the Olympics, this guy saying to me, he goes, just uh, whoever's got the best biochemist, you know, is, is going to win. And, and I was really... You know, I was really surprised, actually, at that comment at that time. And, and of course, you know, what, what, what ended up transpiring was, was exactly that with respect to her. And, you know, Lance Armstrong's an even better example. Um, but I don't think we're going to change that. Um, what was I going to say? It's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating kind of area. And as I say, I, I think it is, I think, I think um, I absolutely think that there is there is a role to be played uh, for clinicians, but whether or not society is willing to, I don't know. I think there'd be a lot of societal backlash against it, and and whether or not it'd ever ever uh, um, get up. Well, Chris, I don't know. Yeah, we were chatting we were chatting earlier before, and I was I was you know telling the story, and I um, just about the the dramas we're having just to have a needle syringe vending machine at Canterbury on the on the wall of the home. And that has been a hugely contentious issue in uh, in uh, Canterbury for the hospital. And, and, and Prof Haber and I were going to do a you know a, a public forum to try, you know, it, it, it just ridiculous stuff. Um, so it's still, you're right. I mean, you're right. We, we in some aspects of, of the work we do, we still are at, at square one. And that is a bit frustrating, but you know, you still just got to go back to basics and just continue to do the groundwork. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, look, uh, I, I I can't see any more questions online at the moment, and we've only got a couple of minutes left. So I might take this opportunity to say um, thank you very much for um, a really really interesting presentation. And I imagine, and uh, you know, I get I I think it's one of those things that uh, I need to keep going over and over myself to remember because I just don't. I just struggle so much with it. So I appreciate the, the, all the different um, uh, aspects that you've gone into today. Um, I should just point out to everybody online, there is uh, no Daria next week uh, because we have the NCRED Symposium in Canberra, which is free to register. Uh, and there's some really, really good talks and you don't obviously, well, that is in Canberra, something, some people will be there in person, but you can still join online. So uh, please get onto the NCRED website and you can um, register for the um, some of the talks there. The next time Daria will be online will be then in two weeks, which is November the 14th, which will be Adele Sheridan Magro on the topic of situational counselling for domestic violence disclosure in the alcohol and drug context, which would be really relevant topic for a lot of our clinicians, uh, especially those really at the at the front lines there. So uh, one, one to join us for, but uh, in the meantime, please join me in thanking um, James Blogg for a really interesting talk on uh, performance and image, image enhancing drugs. Thanks very much, James. My pleasure. Great talking to you all. All the best. See you all next week. Okay.